Bless the Lord, everyone, and welcome to another in our Bible study series. Um, today we will continue looking on the topic, the mind of Christ. Um, let us pray before we, we get started. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Dear God, we thank you for giving us another day. We thank you for this opportunity, O oh God, to look into your words and to learn from your words. Jesus, we pray that your presence will be here. We pray, O oh God, that it will lead and it will guide us. Let your will be done, O oh God. Let your name and your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let us have a quick look at what we are going to be covering today. So we are going to start off our discussion looking at the, initi the, initi the initiation of Jesus' ministry. Um, then we'll, we're going to look at, you know, Jesus as a man of prayer. Um, after which we look at Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. And then time permits, then we'll just look briefly at um, Jesus' teaching as it relates to worship. Amen. So let us get started. Now, um, let us look at Luke 4 and verse 1, Mark 1 and verse 12. Also, we're going to be reading Luke 14, sorry, Luke 4 and verse 14. Um, oftentimes, we, you know, we hear about a wilderness experience. It is a common phrase that is used in our church circle. And um, there are different reasons why a person will go into the wilderness, you know, as we, as we, we, we would say. You know, some per sometimes our wilderness experience is because of something that we did wrong. You know, we made a wrong decision. We go against the known will of God, and we find ourselves in a wilderness experience. And there are other reasons, too, that one might find himself in a wilderness, or, you know, having a wilderness experience. However, there's also a third reason where you are led into the wilderness through the Spirit of God. And this, is, was, and this was the case with Jesus Christ. Um, let us look at the scripture. And we're going to compare Luke and Mark just to see the difference in the, um, you know, in the synoptic gospel. So let us have Luke. So Luke 4 verse 1 read, Thus, and... Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So notice the Bible is very specific. The Bible said he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Mark was a bit more, um, what, is, what is the term, aggressive in his writing. And let us look at the description that Mark wrote. So Mark said, immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. A bit strong, you know, driveth him into the wilderness. It kind of, and it, it kind of underscore the difference between how Mark wrote and how and how Luke wrote. And we kind of had touched on that before, that this was based on the, their audience. However, from this scripture, it is clear that Jesus' wilderness experience was as a result of the Spirit of God. It was, you know, the Bible, is, the Bible says the Spirit driveth him, you know, which is a strong term. Luke says the Spirit lead him. 
But both of them agreed that it was the spirit that kind of caused him to go into the wilderness experience, to go into that 40 days of fasting and prayer, you know, at the initiation of his ministry. And you'll find that um, is, several persons will testify that, you know, there's this period of wilderness experience before they, they will enter into ministry. We find that, I think, it's, I think if memory serves me right, Paul also had a similar experience in the Arabia desert, you know, um, shortly after he, he got saved and doing his preparation for ministry. Now, the writer, notice how the writer gives us a description of Jesus before the wilderness experience, and he gave us a description of Jesus after the wilderness, exp the wilderness experience, which we're going to look at the description after, which can be found in Luke 14, in, sorry, in Luke 4 and verse 14. Now, the writer did this for us to understand the impact, the impact that the wilderness experience have on him. So let us look at Luke um, 4 and verse 14, and we notice the difference in the description used. So Luke 4 and verse 14 read, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region. So let us look back at the side. So notice it is said that when he was going into the, his wilderness experience, the Bible said that he went, you know, he was full of the Spirit. He was full of the Spirit. However, the scripture says, when he returned out of that experience, after his days of fasting, after he would have spent 40 days and nights in the wilderness, Mark said that he was with the wild beasts and all of those things in, you know, in the wilderness. When he returned, the description changes and he says that he returned in the power of the Spirit. Now, what is the difference between these two terminology? You know, the, the writer seems to be suggesting that there is a difference between being full of the Spirit and being in the power of the Spirit. You know, kind of suggests, the, the, the latter kind of suggests that, you know, the anointing was fully upon him and he was now ready to do mighty works that was going to be initiated by the, you know, by the Spirit of God. And so it is, it is interesting, you know, the, 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 two, the terminologies that was used before and after. And many times, as I said before, you know, we can go into a wilderness experience because of things that we do and because of things that we fail to do. And, you know, God is so good and great that even in those circumstances, the child of God will still benefit from, from going through a wilderness experience. You know, how do I know? Well, the scripture said it, that he worketh all things. He worketh all things unto the good, you know, of them that loved him, um, and to them that are called according to his purpose. So, so God, so even if you cause it to happen, God will still, you will still benefit from it. But I believe that the benefit might be exponentially different when you are led in the, into that experience through the Spirit. Because God is working out some things in you and he wants to bring you through a process that will, you know, prepare you for ministry and to prepare you for his work. And um, when, I, when, when I study the book of the, the Gospels, 
what, one of the things that John Paul taught me is that Jesus was an example for us. And a lot of the things that he does and a lot of things that, you know, the, the way he, 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 he do the things he does is an example to us. And it, it kind of it kind of um it kind of allow, allow us give us you know the um the path it it shows us how we are to operate you know so he is the example and so you will find that you know as you are led into ministry you will find that sometimes you will have these this this wilderness experience also and when i say ministry I am not using the, I'm, I'm, I'm using the term generic, generically. I'm not saying that it has to be like preaching or it has to be like pastoring, you know, or it has to be like those big things that we always associated with, 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 with ministering. But it can be simple as, as even working at the altar. Well, working at the altar is not a simple thing, but understand what I'm saying you know it can be just being a part of the host to host team it can be just being a part of hospital ministry or um, home Bible study whatever your area of ministry you will find that some Jesus will prepare you for that sometimes um, at, at the initiation stage and when he does it you know you will find that you will re you will get great success Amen. So after, after this period in the wilderness, you know, the, we will take up back with Jesus here now in Luke 4 and verse 17. Um, let us look at it. Luke 4 and verse 17. The Bible says, and there was the, um, the in fact, let us start at verse 16. The scripture said, and he came unto Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as the custom was, he went into the synagogue on, on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there delivered unto him a book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20 said, and he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of them all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, this, I believe, is, one, is probably the most profound declaration. It's probably, it's probably the most profound declaration that have been ever made by a man. Somebody said Jesus wasn't a man. Yes, he was a man. He was God also. But he was a man. So here Jesus is saying that, you know, Jesus is saying that I, have, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. He's saying through this action, you know, through what, what, what he did, you know, I am the king that you are, wait, you are waiting for. I am the Lamb of God. That is going to take away the sins of the world. You know. And notice. He tells us. Through the scripture. 
You know, where he get, he's going to get his, powers, his power from. He says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So, so it is the anointing of God that was upon him. That is going to enable him to effectively preach the gospel to the poor. And this is a fundamental principle in the Bible and in scriptures and in Christendom. You know, we all have our own talents and our own natural ability that we were born with. Some of us is good at just speaking, you know, naturally. Or, you know, some of us is good at, we are teaching, you know, some of us is good at doing various things. But ultimately, when it comes to God, and when it comes to the kingdom of God, the thing that he will draw on is that anointing that, you know, he is, is that is um, upon our lives. It is the anointing that will enable us to do what God wants us to do. And so, we, you know, there's a tendency to lean on self. You know, there's a tendency to lean on, you know, what you know before and all of that. But ultimately, you know, it is the anointing of God that gives us the ability to perform. Um, Paul asked the rhetorical question. He said, he, you know, he said, um, how can they preach unless they be sent? I'm, I'm going to come to that, you know. But God will prepare those who he um, is, you know, is, is going to use. And when God wants you to do a certain thing, you know, the Spirit of God will, gives you, will give you the capability to do the thing. God will furnish you with the capability to do it. You know, and that is why we are to seek the Lord. We are to seek the Lord to find out where we are to be and what, you know, what area of the church we are to serve in. And, you know, where he wants us to serve. Because one of the worst things can happen to us is to find ourselves in a position in the church that we are not anointed for. And as I said, I'm not talking about the big things, no, necessarily. I'm not talking about being a pastor or a preacher or anything. Even the, the, the simplest of things, even working at the altars, where well, somebody argued that everybody probably should work at the altar. Well, fine. But... In your ministering to God, you know, God is the one that really equipped us to serve and the anointing gives us the ability. When we look at the life of um, Samson, it, it, it kind of illustrates the point that I'm making. God, for some reason, wanted Samson to be strong. And, he want, and the, the, the things that God wanted him to do required him to be strong. God wanted him to tear down some, some, some strongholds in the life, in, in, in um, Philistine or wherever. He wanted them to do that. And so what he did, he equipped him. And so that when he got anointed, he became strong and was able to perform the task that God wanted him to do. In the same way, there are some folks that when they get anointed, they are able to preach. There are some folks that when they get anointed, they are able to say to the sick, be thou well. You know, there are some folks that when they get anointed, they, become, they are able to prophesy. So all of these things, they... The, the, the power that we work with, and we're going to come to the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord's Prayer says, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, the power that we need in order to effect change and to do work in the kingdom of God. It comes from the Spirit. And this is what Jesus was saying, that he was anointed to do the thing. But not only did the Bible said 
that he was anointed, the scripture went on to say, he has, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So he was anointed and he was sent. And this is kind of my little pet peeve. But let us look um, at some scriptures that highlight the importance of being sent. And the first one we want to look at, um, if you can just go to the next one. Yeah, the first one we want to look at is, um, let us look at Acts 13 and verse 4. Um, so, one of the, the things that we, when we look at the life of Paul, we see that Paul was, was very successful in his ministry. He was successful in his ministry. Um, I have heard person attribute his success to, you know, the, the fact that he was well learned and that he was a scholar even before he got saved. But I um, would like to think that, you know, it was, it was really the spirit of God that equipped him. And Paul actually said it. He said, all of these things before I count them but dung, I count them as worthless as garbage really um, and so he wasn't pulling at any of those things from his past but the, the 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 secret for his power was the fact that he was anointed even like Christ was anointed and here we find in Acts 13 verse 4 the scripture say um, so they being they in fact let us read verse 3 start at verse 3 And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And verse 14 says, And so, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, you know, they departed unto Cilicia, and from thence they say. So, you, you know, so what am I saying? That Paul was sent, Paul and Barnabas was sent by God. And it comes back again to the scripture in Romans that I was quoting. The scripture says, how can they preach unless they be sent? What Paul is talking about? Paul is saying, you know, with, with, with what authority? You know, with what power are they able to preach effectively unless they are sent by God? And so... We have to understand this. And we can't just say that, you know, um, all of us were sent when, when, when he, he in, the, in the Great Commission. Yes, the Great Commission is there where God sent out his disciples. But, there, but, but why would Paul mention this again? In, in Romans 10, after the Great Commission, he is eluding, he knows that you know, for us to be effective, for us to be um, effective, we, we, you know, we can't just get up and go. But we should go to the Lord and ask the Lord to send us, you know, where he will. Next. Okay, so... I'm going to look at these two scriptures because I want to underscore this point. Because um, I think it's a very important point. Um, let us look at the scripture that I quoted in Romans 10 and verse 15. Also, I'm going to look at Exodus 3 and verse 12. Okay, so the, the, the scripture I quoted in Romans, it said, And how shall they preach except they be sent? At his, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace 
and bring glad tidings of good things. And so Paul was underscoring here the point that we really should be sent by the Holy Ghost. You know? Um, let us also look at the scripture in Exodus. He says, and he said, certainly, this is God speaking now. And God says, and he said, certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be a token or a sign unto thee that I have sent thee. Okay? A little awkwardly word. Uh, I guess the translate, translator did that. But what this scripture is saying is that God will really follow those that he sent. So, he will follow those that I sent. That's what he's saying here, you know. He said, this is a token. He said, and he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this is a token or a sign that I have sent thee. So God is saying, when persons come, look to see if I am there. And this is a sign or a token that I, am, I have sent them. God, no, God won't necessarily follow you to places that he didn't send you. And we know, we know that if God is there, then the supernatural is present. We know when God is there, then miracles, you know, can be a part of that thing. It doesn't have to be, but it can be, you know, when God is there. And we know what happened in Exodus, how God showed up for them mightily and showed that his presence was there and that he was behind the thing. And so, again, you know, I'm, I'm making the point that, you know, in, in order for us to be effective, and this is the point I'm making, in order for us to be effective in anything we do in God, in, in the church, we have to ensure that we are anointed and that we are sent by God to operate in that space. Okay? And so, um, and uh, again, I underscore the point. So it's not that I'm not speaking here, I'm just, just preaching. You know, but God can send you to the altars. God can send you to work on the host to host team. He can send you. Look at, let us look at Luke 10 and verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great. So the harvest truly is great. At this time, the, at that time, the harvest truly was great. And I believe at this time in our lives, the harvest truly is great. There's a lot of things to do for God. But... As it was then, even so it is now. The laborers are few. Just a few persons. Just a few of us, just a few persons will go out on the house to house team. When you call the altar call, even though it's a big church, it's just a few persons will come to the altar to pray for people. Just a few just a few on the, house, on the home Bible study team. By far not the majority in the church. Every ministry you can think of. It's just a few. And these are, I'm talking about ministries now that are open to everyone. There's no restriction. Everybody can be a part of the missions team. But we just find that there's just a handful of persons that is involved. But the Lord says, you know, but, but, but the scriptures say, pray. He, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers in his, in, in his harvest. And so, you know, sometimes we, we will go on this campaign to recruit people. And sometimes a lot of people will come. And then a lot of people don't stay. But I have found that when we pray and ask the Lord to send people into his ministry, into the ministry, you'll find that people will come. And the people that come, we find that they don't really give a lot of trouble, you know, and they will stay. 
they will be mean. And so, yes, we can come up with an ingenious ideas to, to, to um, encourage people to come out. And we will still do that, you know. But we find that there's a big difference when God send a person and tell them to work. Nobody don't have to run behind them and say, yeah, come to the altars, you know. No, you will find them just come out because the Spirit beat them and, you know, they were sent by God to operate in this cause. And so, the in, at the initiation of his ministry, Jesus declares, you know, where he gets his power from. You know, the power to operate in the ministry that God sent, as God has given to him. And this was through the anointing that he received, or that, or that was upon him. And it is, it is perfectly okay to say that. You know, Jesus is God. I know that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him. But it is perfectly okay to say God has anointed Jesus. It's perfectly okay. Um, and he was also, and Jesus also operated in the space that he was sent. Um, I believe, you know, if we do this, the, the, if we operate like that, um, then, you know, then we may have more success. Not that we're not having success now, because we're seeing people being born in the kingdom. We're seeing, you know, the church is moving on and we're seeing growth and we're seeing new people and all of that. But, you know, we could have more if we are more, um, what is the word? You know, if we are more aware of these principles. So, so just before we, we, we look at Jesus being a man of prayer, um, we, I want to make the point also that in, um, in, Saint, in Luke 4, Jesus gave us the, man, the mandate that he got, that he had. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. He said that God has anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor. Notice, he singled it out and said, God is anointed to preach to the poor. He qualified the statement. I'm not saying rich people can't be saved. But I'm saying, here the writer specified that Jesus was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. And that he was sent now to heal the brokenhearted. He was sent to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind. Okay, so this is the mandate that Jesus had. And he fulfilled the mandate while he was in the body of Jesus Christ. While, you know, while he was upon the earth. I want, to, I want to say to you that in today's life, in, it, in today, you know, where Jesus is in heaven, he might be in heaven, but he's also upon the earth. How is he upon the earth? Through the spirit that he has given unto us. Jesus remains on the earth through the Holy Spirit because we know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. And so that's the, the, the mandate that he had has not really changed. But what has changed is that now he is accomplishing this mandate through the body of Christ or through the church. So he is not, you understand the point? He is accomplishing this mandate through his body his body now is not the physical body of Jesus Christ, but is the mystical body of the church. So the Bible says we are his hands, we are his feet, you know. God is still preaching the gospel to the poor, but he's doing it through us, through the Holy Ghost that he has given us. And so we are the body of Christ, and he is now trying to accomplish this says, said mandate of preaching the gospel to the poor, of healing the brokenhearted, of preaching deliverance to the captive, he is still trying to accomplish that said mandate 
but now he is doing it through the church, through you and I, who are a part of the body of Christ. Okay? And so, you know, the mandate remains the same, but the body that he is doing it has changed in essence. I hope you understand the spirit of what I'm saying here. Okay? Um, and so, yes, Jesus, that is how Jesus started his ministry. You know, before he would have started, you, you know, also that he would have been baptized before. Um, and that, you know, he would have, um, would have seen the spirit of God like a dove came to, to sit upon him. That was a sign particularly for John. And, um, and, John, and one of the reasons why John baptized was for this sign. John was baptizing people and looking at them to see who is the Christ, really. You know, but we're not going to go too much in that. Um, so let us look at some of the... We're going to look at some of the characteristics of Jesus. Well, not the characteristics, some of the teaching of Jesus. But before, we want to look at Jesus is a man of prayer. Um, that is a statement that is made there. Jesus was a man of prayer. I'm, I'm going to go through all of these scriptures because I, wanted to, I want to underscore this point. Because if there is anybody, if there is any one of us that had enough in us that we could rely on what is within us as it were, certainly it was Jesus. You know? But, but we find that Jesus was a man of prayer. Let us look at these scriptures. Uh, as I said, we're going to take the time and we're going to go through all of them. So let us look at the first one. Matt, in Matthew 14 and verse 23, the Bible says, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Apart there means he was by himself. And when, the eve, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. Let, let us see what verse 23 says. Okay, so we're not going to get into that. We know after that, he walked on water. And, you know, we know the, dram the, the dramatic that lies there, you know. And we know that it follows a period of prayer where he spent most of the night in prayer. And some might link it, some may even link it, link it to say, you know, it's no coincidence that the day that he walked on water, he, the night before he spent all, uh, a great portion of the time in prayer. Let us look at Mark 1 and verse 35. So Mark 1 and verse 35 states, that and in the morning rising up a great while before day or before you know the start of the day before the sun come out uh, probably he went out and depart into a solitary place and there prayed so jesus would get up early in the morning and he would go to a solitary place and he would just pray next scripture Luke 5 and verse 16 said, And he will withdraw himself into the wilderness and pray. So it's not just the wilderness experience and then that's it. And, you know, but he will go back, he, he would visit back there. So I want you to see the pattern. As I said, I'm using a lot of scriptures because I want you to see that the pattern that Jesus consistently prayed. Um, let us get the next scripture. Luke 16, verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. You understand? So this is not just... This, is, was, this was his, his, um, his a habit. You know, the Bible says he would... The scripture says, and it came to pass that in those days that he went out into a mountain. He went out 
into a mountain place. Again, he wanted to be alone. And, and he continued all night in prayer to God. You will just pray. Jesus was a man of prayer. If you ask, so what is, was his defining thing? You can't really, I don't believe we can give a proper definition or description of Jesus without mentioning that he was a man of prayer. That was one of his defining characteristics. Let us get the, the next, an, an next scripture. Is there more? Again, in Luke 9, verse 18, he said, And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. So the, his disciples came to him. So he was alone praying, and then his disciples would come after. And he asked them, saying, You know, whom say the people that I am? And we know the, the, the rest of that scripture, how Peter confessed that he was Christ and all that. But what I want to highlight is that, again, the Bible described Jesus as praying, being someplace praying, alone. Ne next scripture. 9 verse 28. And it came to pass about an, an, an eight day after this, saying, he took Peter and John and went up into a mountain to pray. So this is probably, the, this is one of the few times, one of the few times when we see he takes someone with him to pray. Normally he goes alone. He didn't even, most of the time the Bible says, describe him as going alone. Didn't even carry his disciples. But he would leave them and he would go alone to pray. This is one of the few times mentioned in scripture where he actually, the scripture said that he took John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And we know what follows here. That it was here that he transfigured. Eh? He transfigured and his garment became as white as light. And here is a revelation. If you want to know who Jesus is, you have to spend time in prayer with him. Because it is in prayer that he revealed. You, you understand what I'm saying here in the scripture? It says, and it came to pass, you know, he took Peter and John and James and went up into the mountain to pray. So it is while he prayed that they, he was transfigured and the disciples saw him in a different light. You know? A lot of times, the revelation, getting a, a revelation, a greater revelation of who Jesus is and having that impression on our heart of who he is, it is not, it is, a lot of times it is done in prayer. It is while you are in prayer that God will reveal himself. Remove, he, he zip back, as it were, the, 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 the humanity and allow his divinity to come to the forefront. And so they saw him. The Bible says he was as white as light. And so, but that, where did that happen? That happened while they were in prayer. Can, let us continue. Um, that's all the scripture we okay so, so Jesus was a man of prayer um, as I said before he prayed in solitary places outside of the eyes of the public so he didn't pray where everybody can see him the Pharisees was stand in stark contrast to Jesus they prayed, they like to pray in public. They like to play, pray in the marketplace and in the synagogue, you know. But Jesus himself says that when you pray, you should go, you should enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, you should pray to the Father in secret, the Bible says. Pray to the Father in secret and the Father that see it in secret, he will reward thee openly. And so Jesus said it, and we see he practices it. Now, um, a funny story. I remember when I just got saved, 
One of my friends came to me and said, boy, Ron, you know, Bible said we should go in our closet, but in their heart. In their heart, my closet hot and my wet when I come out is not comfortable. And I laugh at him and I was like, I was saying, you know, it's not literal closet, but it actually was a literal closet that they had to go into. Their closet was maybe a little different from ours. But they could go in it easily. And, they, and it had a door that they could close. And Jesus literally was saying they should go in there to pray. But the spirit behind what he was saying was that you should really pray to the Father in secret. Outside of the eyes of everyone else. That's what, that, 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 that is the principle. That's what, you know, that is the spirit of what he was saying. And we see that, you know, in his, in his ministry or in his life, you know, the Bible didn't say he goes into a closet. But the Bible says that he went in a solitary place. Often the scripture says that. That he went into a solitary place. And there he prayed. You know? Um, and so, you know, he wants us to pray. No, no, I am not knocking corporate prayer. So let, let me get back to the, 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 Yeah, so the story where the guy said, you know, he would go there literally to pray. And I was saying, you know, you don't literally have to go there. But, but yes, the scripture was saying we should literally go there. And I, and I said, the point is that you may not have a closet, or you might not be able to go into your closet. Like my closet, I can't go into my closet. Because my closet, there's a little place for the wall. And t-shirt, clothes, and shoes full up all of it. So I don't have any space. Even if I wanted to go there. But, so you might be like me. You, may, you might not have a closet to go into. But, you know, the essence of what he's saying, I think you can obey which is you can go to a solitary place. Pastor teach, preached to us about the there place. There is a place. You know, I don't know if you remember that message. There is a place that you meet with God in secret. It's important. Now, I am not knocking corporate prayer. Corporate prayer is necessary. The Bible speaks of the blessing of unity. And, that there is a, and I believe also that there is a blessing in praying in unity. That we probably can't get anywhere else. The Bible says, there the Lord commanded a blessing. So there is a blessing to pray in corp corporate prayer and to pray in unity, unity, and unity, unity and to worship God together. There is a great blessing there. But there is also a great blessing in praying to God in secret and you need to, in order to get that blessing, you need to do it in secret. The Bible says, God that see it in secret, he is going to reward thee openly. You know? And so I teach the Young Converts class, and I always try and emphasize the importance of prayer. Um, prayer should not be haphazard. I don't believe that prayer should be haphazard. That's my opinion now. I don't believe it should be haphazard where... You just pray anytime, you know. I believe that if you want to be consistent in prayer, in, in, if you want to have a lifestyle of prayer, then you should really, um, you know, put some thought into it and probably do up a prayer schedule, you know. You could do that. Or you can make a mental schedule and plan a time that you're going to meet with God. Plan it out. And put it in your calendar where you have all the other things that you're going to do in the day. Plan it. And also, I, have, I always encourage them to have a place. Because sometimes we want to pray, but the place can be, can be a hurdle. So put some, thought, put some thought to it. And also um, consider a place that you are going to pray, where you're going to pray. Um, people even went as far as to say that there are some benefits in praying consistently at a place, at one place, at a particular place. People go that far. I'm not necessarily going that far, but folks went that far. In fact, I remember ministers actually speak of a place at the Bible school in Wildman Street. Um, 
at UPC headquarters. And it is said that there was a little room there where a lot of the time, a lot of times, the students would resort there to pray. And people testify that just by walking past, they would feel an anointing. You know? As I said, that is, persons go that far to see that there is like a residual effect when you pray at a place and it's easy to reach God there. Maybe it's not, maybe it even, maybe you can even prove it from the scripture because, you know, the Bible encourages us to build an altar and all of that. But I'm not necessarily saying that, but I'm just saying, have, consider a place that you're going to pray. You know, whether it is in the bathroom, that downstairs bathroom that nobody uses, you know, whether it is that abandoned building at work where nobody, nobody uses. You know, sometimes at the office they may have a little training room that is scheduled. You can see the schedule and you can know that if you come early enough, you can have it all to yourself. You know, you, know, you can do it. You can, there are many ways, there are many places that you can establish your own little place to pray. But do give it some thought and have a place. And so, in our attempt to try and imitate Christ, in our attempt to try and imitate Christ, the first point of departure is to try and imitate his prayer life. Now, I can't overemphasize this, this point. You notice at the first, um, when I just started the, the, the series, I started off by saying we are to follow Christ. I underscored the importance for us to, to have a vision. The Bible says without a vision, the people perish. And I said that that vision should be for us to be like Christ. Each day we should try and be a little bit more like him. We should imitate him. Now, we, if, we, no, we, no, if we, are, we are not careful, uh, we should be careful as we try and imitate or try to act like him. We have to be careful because if we are not careful, we may end up with hypocrisy. And, and I tell you what I mean. You know, if we, if we try to reproduce the things that he did without having the conviction that he did, then we are merely acting, you know, but we are not truly like him. We are just merely acting pretentiously even like him. However, if we should imitate his lifestyle of prayer, then... You know, I believe that that is where we should start. That is where we should start. Try and imitate his lifestyle of prayer. And then the convictions that he got, that he have, I believe that prayer is that channel that brought him those convictions. You know? And so we can have those convictions if we imitate his lifestyle of prayer. I'm not saying it the way... I want you to get it, but I hope the Spirit will just minister. And you get what I'm saying here. You understand? Get, I want you to understand that before we try to imitate his miracles, we must imitate his prayer life. Before, before we try to imitate his preaching and the, and the authority in which he spoke, we have to first try and imitate his prayer life or get the imitation or you know we have to get the prayer part right and if we get the prayer part right then the other things i believe will come more easily right and so i'm not saying that um we should steadfast you know this steadfastness in prayer so yes we have to be steadfast in prayer but i'm not saying that it is achieved by a regimental approach you know, but rather to building of a relationship with God. So you enjoy spending time in his presence. You know, I have been on both sides of the fence. And I want you to find that scripture, Isaiah 12, verse 3. I have been on both sides of the fence. I have forced myself to say, look here, you're going to pray whether you like it or not. And you go down 
and you look up and it's five minutes and it feels like an hour. I have been there. You understand? You look up and it's 15 minutes and you say, no, the clock now work. But I've also been on the other side of the fence where I went down and when I look up, 45 minutes. I mean, I said, no, it can't be 45 minutes already. That means I only have 15 minutes for work start and I want to spend more time. You know, so I have been on both sides of the fence. Um, the Bible says here that it is with joy. It is with what? With joy. He shall draw water out of the wells of salvation. What is, he, what, what, what is this scripture talking about? When you are really making strides into God, are making strides in Christendom, are making strides in salvation, making strides in be, being a Christian, it comes with a joy. When you are drawing water from the well of salvation, when you are pulling down virtue from Christ, it is a pleasant experience. Right? No, I know. No, I know that there are benefits to get from suffering. You know, the scripture also says that if we suffer with him, you know, we shall reign with him and all of that. The, I spoke earlier about the wilderness experience, which is also an unpleasant thing, generally, you know. But Isaiah 12 and verse 3 is telling us that it is with joy that we draw waters from the well of salvation. When we are really living for God, it's a pleasant experience. And praying, I have found to be a pleasant experience. And one of the things that puzzles me the most is why I don't pray more. Why I don't pray more. Why I spend so much time doing other things. Things that doesn't really give you much. You know? Well, I, I, I am a sports, I'm a sports fan. And sometimes I will watch an entire basketball game match. And at the end of the day, yeah, you know, and I, yeah, but I could have spent the time, probably the time would be better spent in prayer. No, I'm not saying you can't watch a basketball match, please, but I'm just saying, when you are truly, you can truly fall in love with prayer. And I believe this is what happened to Jesus, where he, fall, he fell in love with prayer. And so nobody don't have to, to, um, to, 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 to coerce you to pray. Nobody don't have to say, go and pray and it is a pleasure. It's something that you look forward to. You know, Paul said it, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. There is joy in serving God. And when you are really, really living for God and the anointing is upon you, it is a pleasant experience. The scripture says, you know, remember the scripture says, in the presence of the Lord. What? There is Fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And so don't, don't look at it as, yeah, I forgot, you know, a regimental approach. But in building a relationship with God, you will want to pray. And you will enjoy spending time in prayer. So Jesus was a man, I said, is a man of prayer, not was. Because he's still praying, even now. The Bible says he ever liveth, making intercession for the saints. So even at this time, Jesus is still making intercession. He's still praying for us, his saints. Amen. So if you want to imitate God, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I'm repeating myself for emphasis. If you want to really imitate God, if you want to be like Christ, I, I would say 50 to 70% of that is imitate his prayer life. 
And the rest, I believe, will come easy if we can imitate his, his prayer life. All right, let us move on. So now, um, so, so as I said before, Jesus was a man of prayer, and his disciples would have, would have noticed this. His disciples would have noticed this. Now, most of the information that I'm using here in, these, in the next two slides were actually taken from the book. Um, you can, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see it. FC um, missions, a mission seminar that was held in 1996. That sounds like such a long time ago. But yes, I was around that time and I was saved that time. <laughs> and it was a very, um, you know, it was a blessing. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the information that I will use here is going to come from this prayer book. This book on pr this seminar that was done. Okay, so now, as I said before, you know, Jesus was a man, a man of prayer. And um, his disciples would have noticed this. You know, they would have noticed that he would have spent all night in prayer. And then the next morning, he was walking on water. He would have, they would have probably noticed that uh, we notice rather that before he called his disciples, he spent time again, a considerable time in prayer before he called them. And they will, they will see a pattern in his life where before any, any great decision, before some of his marvelous work, you know, he would spend time in prayer. Jesus would have um, turn, use the five loaves and two fishes to feed a multitude. Excuse me. But before he did that, again he prayed. And so they noticed his lifestyle of prayer. And the Bible said that they came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Um, let us look at Luke 11, verse 1 to 4. So Jesus said, so the disciples came to him, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he sees one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us, or, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now, I remember the first time I was teaching. I think I was teaching the senior high class at the time. And I said, you know, I'm, we're going to look at prayer in today's class. And we're going to look at, you know, how to pray. And I remember one of my, one of my very bright students, very brilliant, she stood up and said to me, I don't need anybody to teach me how to pray. Because prayer is communication. And you don't teach me how to talk to my mother. You don't teach me how to talk to my father. You don't teach me how to talk to my spouse, by extension. You know, why do you need to teach me how to pray? And I was bold for a few seconds. I was like, well, she kind of right. But then I went back to the scripture and I said, but what did Jesus say when he asked? When they asked Jesus, to teach them how to pray. What did he say? He didn't say, you don't need to learn. You know, he recognized that, you know, if our prayer are to be effective, then we need to pray a certain way. And so, here in, in Luke 11, verse 1, in Luke 11, verse 1 to 4, the Bible calls it a form. In Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, the Bible calls it a model. You know, um, most of us know it as the Our Father prayer. That's how we refer to it. Um, but I believe that this was the method 
that Jesus used to pray. I believe he had a method that he used. And this was the very method. And he was teaching the method to his disciples so that they can be as successful as he was. So let us look at it. Um, it says, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he sees one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us how to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. Verse 2. And he said unto them, when he pray, say, you know, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. And we know the Our Father prayer as it is called. But if we should look back at the slide, what we will find is that this prayer, it has, the prayer has, the prayer has an address. It has an address and it has, I believe, seven petition. Right? So, so the, 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 it has an address and it has seven petitions. And so we're going we're gonna to spend the time today and we're going to go through it. As I said, I teach a young convert class. Pardon me if this is below you. But, you know, um, I believe it's something that we can all benefit from, even if it means just to bring it back to our memory. So it starts off with the address. So as I said before, the Lord's Prayer, we normally, sometimes we just repeat it. Our oh, Father, what in heaven, you know? But Jesus prayed for ours. He prayed for ours. And I believe this is the, the method that he used. So it is not just something that we must repeat, but it is a method. It is a model or a form, you know, to guide our prayer. And we can spend considerable amount of time praying the Our Father prayer. Okay? So let us look at the first thing, which is the address. Our Father which art in heaven. That is the address. And you can find that, as I said, it is in Luke 11, verse what, verse 2 gives you the address. Matthew 6, verse 9 also give you, address, give you the address. So in, in the address, God is presented here to us in his most tender aspect and relationship. And that is the father-son relationship. So it is, yes, we are acknowledging God and we are saying, Our Father which art in heaven. But it's also putting our mind, it's putting our mind in the correct frame of mind, as it were. We are saying, we are reminding, we are reminded here that God is our Father. And as, the fa as our Father, He is the one that is looking out for our best interest. A Father, you know, naturally loves His Son. And will give anything that the son, anything that the son needs that will make him better, that will make him, you know, a better person. The, any, any father will willingly give. So in the, in the address, we are acknowledging God as our father. It refers to the one who has our best interest at heart. You know, so it's not just some God million miles away no but he is our father he is our father um again the over here it reminds us that he is not only your father but he is our father he's not just my father you know but he is brother gary father also his sister jennifer father also he's the person that sits beside you in church it is his, it is, he is their father also. And so it reminds us of our responsibility, not just to pray for ourselves, but to pray for the brethren also. The same thing that you are praying for yourself for, oftentimes, is the same thing that the brethren need. 
that your brother need. Right? Um, the second part of the, of the address, which art in heaven, you know, it safeguards us against unholy familiarization. So we are saying, yes, our, he's our father, but he is in heaven, you know. And so that is the address. It is important. The address is important. And I tell you why. If you have a mail, if you are sending somebody a mail and you get the address wrong, then the person is not going to get the mail. You know, sometimes, and this is mostly in, in when we are praying in public, sometimes we, our, our prayer has the wrong address. And it's easy, and it's easy to just get caught up in the moment. And we, we are praying, but we are not praying to God. We are praying to the church, you know. We are praying to the church. We want persons to know how well we can pray. And oftentimes, you will see people even praying and they are explaining things. And you are like, but why are they are explaining all of that? God knows everything. You know, but sometimes it is a giveaway that they really, as some people would say, they really pray or preach. There is a message there for the church in the prayer. Right? It sounds humorous, you know, but you'd be surprised how often it is true. You're praying to God, but there's a message there in the, for the church, you know. So when, when we pray like that, God may not answer us because we're not addressing the thing to him. You know, and so it's important that we get the address right. So the first petition here is, hallowed be thy name. This petition comes first to show that the glorifying, the glorifying of God's great name is the ultimate end of all things. So everything we ask for ultimately will glorify his name. All other requests must be subordinate to this one and be in pursuant of it. So everything else that we ask for, everything that we ask for in prayer, we should not ask for anything that won't bring glory to his name. So God will not do, and, and, and the reverse is true, God will not do anything that doesn't bring glory, you know, to his name. We cannot pray properly unless the glory, the other thing is that we cannot pray, pray properly unless the glory, glory of God be dominant in our desires. So when we pray, yes, we have a genuine need that we are praying for, you know, but... Somewhere in our mind, we also have to be cognizant that we want to bring glory to God. Or this is a channel to bring glory to God's name. And we know what the name of God already is. The name of God speaks to the person of his attribute. Um, it speaks to who he is and all of that. Um... Here, so, uh, um, here also, or uh, even in the, in, the fur, in the address, you want to be able to put in some praise. You know, praise is important in praying. Um, and so you want to put in some praise where you praise him. Some people, what they'll do, and um, I probably don't have an example in the Bible for this, but they will praise him in light of the situation that they're praying about. So for example, if, you're, if you go to God and you're praying that God will heal you, you can start off your prayer, you know, our Father and all of that, but you can spend some time praising him that, to say that, you know, he is a physician, you are the great physician, oh God. You can heal anybody. You know, so you praise him, you spend some time and you praise him in light of the situation. If you, if you have financial needs, you can say, God, you are the financial controller. Yeah? You know, if whatever, whatever, you know, if you, if you have needs, you can praise him. That's a God, you are the Jehovah, you are Jehovah Jireh. You can provide anything. So you praise him in light of the situation. 
that, you know, that you are going to be praying for. So the second, <coughs> sorry, the second petition is, thy kingdom come. This petition set forth the means by which God's glory is to be manifested and promoted on, on, on earth. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, we are also praying, is also submitting ourselves to him. Right? In prayer. And so when we say, thy kingdom come, Notice that Jesus, when he speaks to his disciples, he says that the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither will man say, you know, lo, there is the kingdom, or lo, here is the kingdom. But the kingdom of God is where? The kingdom of God is within the heart of men. So when you pray, thy kingdom come, what you're, you are in essence doing is saying, God, reign over me. You are saying, God, you know, have control over me. Let thy will be done, which is the other part that we're praying. But, you know, we're saying, let thy kingdom come. So we're praying for God's kingdom to come. And it has to start in our own lives. So we're saying, God, in our own lives, have the, let your will be done in our own life. Let, you know, let reign in our house, reign in our school, reign in our heart. That's what we're saying. God, reign in our heart. We have to first start there. And then we can say, God, reign in the life of others. Reign in our brother life. Reign in the unsaved life. Let your kingdom come in, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. Sorry, let thy, let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, we are, again, this is where we can spend some time and submit to God. Jesus did this at Gethsemane. When he said, um, God, you know, it's past, he, he said, he said uh, the scripture says that he said, um, you know, all things are, are possible with thee, you know. Um, in essence, he's saying that you could probably do this without me having to die. You know, nevertheless, he said, though, not my will, but thy will be done. And so we need to pray. We need to spend some time, some time in our prayer and submit ourselves to God. The things them that we are doing, reflect on them and see if these are in the will of God. Are, you know... How we spent last week, or, last, or yesterday, were we doing things that is outside of his will? Maybe there is a friendship that we have that God doesn't want us to have. When we go in prayer, we say, thy will be done. We are willing to sacrifice that friendship so that we can have friendship with God. So it is a time that we spent also, when we, you know, when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's also a time when we surrender our hearts to the Lord. And we are praying for God's will to be done. We are praying for God's will to be done in church. When God's will is done in church, you know, people are saved. It is God's will for people to receive the Holy Ghost. You know, it is God's will for people to live right. So, so there, is abund there is an abundance of things that we can pray for here when we are praying, Thy, will be, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. You know? Um, and as I said, we can, we, can, we can group both of them in the interest of time because they are very similar. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So we spend time to surrender ourselves to God. We pray that the will of God be done in our lives. We pray that the will of God be done in school. We pray that the will of God be done in church. We pray that the will of God be done in Jamaica as an island. We pray that the will of God be done in our neighbor's life. And as I said, a lot of times the will of God can even come back now to praying for them to be saved because it is the will of God for them to be saved. You know, it's the will of God for people to live right. So there is an abundance of things that we can pray for here. 
so the, the, the so that's the second and the third you know we kind of did that in one so the next one we want to look at is give us give us this day our daily bread give us this day our daily bread um so this, this petition is concerned about, about, um, concern our bodily and physical needs. Um, so we are talking about physical bread here, um, primarily um, or firstly. We're talking about our spirit or physical bread. Um, we, are to, we are to go to God and ask him to give us our, you know, the things that we are to eat. Um, Person might say, well, I can skip out this part because I have food. You know, my fridge is full of food. I have money in my pocket. I don't necessarily have to ask God for this. I have, and I can give to others. But I, I will encourage us to still pray. Give us today our daily bread. Because God is omniscient. And that's the wonderful thing about serving a God that is omniscient. He knows what we need and he knows what our bodies lack our physical body he knows what they lack we might think that we know it all and we know you know we are eating from all the food groups but god knows best and and when we pray that i will give us today our daily bread you might god might just give you something that have a certain nutrients that your body need that you that don't even know you know and also, you know, you can find yourself quickly. All that you have can just vanish away, you know. Um, and so it is important for us to pray. Give us today. And notice he said today. Um, we are to be, one of the principles that Jesus taught us is that we are to suffice the day, to the day, the evil thereof. And so we are to be looking for our daily bread. Um, we, don't, we shouldn't be worrying about tomorrow's bread. But let us focus on what we're going to eat today. And tomorrow will take care of itself. Um, so the, 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 the next petition now says, and forgive us our debt. So notice that there is a linkage here with the word and. So the, 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 these, these two petitions are linked by the word and. Um, the implication here is that it says, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. The implication here is that um, if, we, if we don't ask for our sins to be forgiven, our debts to be, our sins to be forgiven, you know, God might not answer our prayer as it relates to bread. That's why it's linked there, you know. And so it is important that we pray for give us this, give us our debt as we forgive those, um, as, we f as we forgive our debtors. Um, again, this is a, a, a point that in prayer we are to pray that God forgive us our sins. Um, every prayer that you pray, you probably. And I'm talking about your secret prayer now, your personal prayer. Every time you pray, you probably should speak to God about sins. I'm not saying that, you know, every day you're sinning. But I'm saying every day you should try and speak to God about the sin. And that is why it's here in the Lord's Prayer, a daily prayer that we should have. Um, not only that, but we are to... Notice he said, and forgive us our debtor as we forgive our debtors. So forgive us and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. So God, so God is saying here that, look here, if you don't forgive others, then I'm not going to forgive you. That's what the word as is there. Um, we have found that some of the people, some of us that have received so much grace from God, we sin so much, so many times. But when others sin, we can't forgive them. You know, I was in a conversation with someone, and the person was bringing up things that this person was doing 
when they were teenagers, the person who was in their 40s, and persons were holding them accountable as it was for things that the people, that these persons, or who the persons were like when they were in their teenage years. You know, it, 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 you know sometimes we are like that. And it's like when a person sin, we're saying that, oh yeah, they reveal them true color. And you hold them in that light for the rest of their life. But no, we can't do that. If, if we do that, that is an indictment on the Lord. You understand? Because God is working on us. And we are to give space to people. You know? We are to forgive people. And, and if we forgive people, you know, then God will forgive us. And so in prayer, we should pray that God forgive us our sins. We, could, we, we can list them if we know them, if we can remember them. List them. Say them, Lord... Um, I, I, I took out, I steal something and forgive me, Lord, I told a lie and forgive me, you know, list them out to God. And also, we should also bring before the Lord people who we probably have up in our heart and ask God to allow us to forgive them. Lord, you know, this brother somehow in spirit just, just rubbed me the wrong way, but you know, Give me the grace to love him and to forgive him. You know, he did something wrong. He did this wrong. Lord, you know, and, and put it before the Lord. One person tell me a trick. He's, they said it is very difficult to hate someone you pray for. It is very hard to hate someone that you are praying for. You are praying that God will bless them that God will, that they will strive and do well and all of that. It's very difficult for you to hate that person. And so, you know, it's why the Bible, one of the reasons why the Bible says we have to pray for our enemies and all of that. So we spend time here in prayer. Remember we are in prayer now. Spend time here in prayer asking the Lord to forgive us, listing our sins and asking um, asking God to, to release people or allow us to release people that we have in our heart. So, you know, so that, you know, we can, we can love them. Um, the next petition says, and lead us not into temptation. So we are literally asking God not to lead us along a path that will cause us to be tempted. Um, lead us not into temptation. That is a part of the prayer. And as I said before, you know, um, we need to pray this. We need to take time out to pray this. And we need to have the, the mindset that we should shun temptation. If we know that there is something that we are weak to, then nothing is wrong with us staying far from it. If you know that there is a tendency for you to do wrong when you are alone on the computer at night. Then nothing is wrong to tell yourself, say, you're not going to go on the computer at night alone. You're going to use the computer in the presence where p other people are. You know, you have, to, you have to be wise. And so lead, lead you and the Bible is saying that we should pray that the Lord will lead us not into temptation. And also, we should not put ourselves in positions that we will be tempted. Don't go to the sister house. If you like the sister, don't go to her house alone at night or in the day. You know, these are some of the things that is just general. But, you know, we are to pray that the Lord will... Um, not lead us along a path that will be tempted. But the Bible says, but deliver us from evil. Right? So, but deliver us from evil. Now, what is evil? Well, evil is every evil is a, a wide term here. Evil can mean evil deeds. You know, it can mean evil deeds. Evil can also mean the demon, demonic forces. You know, there's a, it's a wide 
definition that can be used here. And you know, even can also you, you can even apply to certain weaknesses that you have. You know, you ask God to forgive you of them. You ask God to forgive you of lying, but then you know, now you're asking him to deliver you from that fault or that tendency. Because they are not one and the same, you know. If you have a weakness and you, the weakness causes you to sin, then you ask God to forgive you for the sin. You have to also ask God now to deliver you from that weakness. You know, so deliver us from evil is a wide term. It can mean deliver us from certain faults. It can mean deliver us from certain weaknesses. It can also mean deliver us from demonic forces that will oppress us. And constantly bombard our thoughts with negative things. And constantly bombard our thoughts with sexual things. And God can deliver you from that. You understand? He can deliver you from that. So um, a lot of times you find people will continue in a particular sin. Because they have not effectively pray, deliver us from evil. Or, deliver, or ask God to deliver them. Okay, so the, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, this is the Lord's Prayer. Um, as I said before, you know, this is how Jesus prayed. And this is how he, he, um, this is how he instruct his disciples to pray. These are all elements. How I look at, how I view it are, is is that these are all elements that should be in my prayer each time I pray. You know, each time I pray, I should ensure that these seven elements um, are in, you know, is addressed. And spend some time addressing each of them. Um, let us continue. So, um... Jesus also he taught his disciples to be consistent in prayer. When we look at um, Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, you know, he gives the parable, Jesus presented, Jesus gives the parable about the unjust judge. And the unjust judge, the scripture says that he fear, fear not God, neither regard man. Now, in this parable, Jesus presented the most unlikely character. The most unlikely character is someone who don't fear God and don't regard man. So, them not, you know, they don't fear anything. They don't fear that God is going to do them anything. And they have no regard for man. This is the most, this is, this is a person by unlikely character. I'm saying this is someone that is the hardest person to get something from. Because... They don't fear God, and they have no regard for you. Now, Jesus used this character here in this parable um, to show that, you know, even the worst of persons, a person that fear not God, nor regard man, if you should, you know, constantly ask, you know, the man said, look here, even though I don't fear God, nor regard man. But because this widow troubled me, what, what, what he means by trouble me, she constantly asked him, avenge me, avenge me of my adversary, avenge me. She constantly asked, is constantly asking. The man said, I'm going to avenge her because just to get rid of her, I'm going to do it. So, what, why is Jesus telling us this story? Why is he telling us? Why is he telling us about this? Because Jesus knows that sometimes when we pray, sometimes we may not get the prayer answered right away. And there is a tendency for us to just stop praying and to say, boy, it's not the will of God because we never get the answer. He didn't give me the thing. You know, but he's saying we should be steadfast, we should be consistent in prayer. Asking of the Lord. You know, even if we don't get it on the first time, ask a second time, ask a third time, until he says no. 
You know, we can, we can be consistent. It speaks to faith. Faith is not just believing God, um, going to prayer, and then you pray, and then you, know, you say, well, that's not the will of God, I move on. No. Faith sometimes requires us to wait, to be patient, and say, even though I don't get it the first time, I'm going to ask a second time, and I'm going to wait on God for God to do it. So, you know, Jesus wants us to be consistent in prayer. Let us move on to the next slide. Now, finally on prayer, Jesus wants us to watch and pray. Let us read Matthew 26, verse 41. Okay, so 41 says, Jesus said to his disciples, so the, the occasion here is that Jesus was getting ready to make that sacrifice for, for men, for humanity. You know, and he, he brought his disciples with him this time to pray. And he said, watch and pray. Um, the Bible said when he came back out, they were sleeping. And, you know, he said to them, you know, couldn't you even stay up with me for one hour? And then he went on to make this statement and said, watch and pray that he enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So, so here Jesus gives us, he gives us here the method to overcome temptation. He said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. So if you have a problem that, if you have a sin problem, then prayer is the answer. That's what Jesus is saying. Watch and pray. Now, the watch part, here Jesus is using a, a terminology that they usually use in the old, in old time where someone would physically go to a a high mountain and watch and look and see if an enemy is approaching. And so the person would literally go and watch there at a tower or at a high place and would physically, would physically go there and watch to see if an enemy is, is approaching. So now here the scripture says we, rest, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but again, spiritual wickedness. So, so we are not physically looking for someone, you know, to hurt us, but we are looking to see what, it's, what the devil is using against us. Um, and so we are, severe, we are looking at our life and looking at the things that are happening in our life to see, to try and ascertain where the devil is trying to trip us up and sometimes he will bring a new person in our life. So out of nowhere, this individual just come in our lives. And sometimes we have to be careful to say, you know, is, is the devil actually working through this person to try and get me to fall? Or uh, it could be other things. You know, it could be other habits that he's trying to develop. So what, but, but, but what is important for us here? is to recognize how the strategy that Satan is trying to use against us. You know, where he's targeting. Because sometimes the devil will plan, you know, the devil will plan for weeks or months to ultimately get you to sin down the line. You know, so he will introduce something and gradually increase it until he gets you to fall. So when we watch and pray, we are trying to understand where is it that the devil is trying to, to, to trip us up and pray against it and, you know, implement measure that will help us to, to go against it. So that is what is meant by the term watch. Um, now, Jesus says, the heart is willing. What he means by that? The heart is willing. Sometimes our heart is willing. 
It means that we have a willingness to do the things of God. You know, we have a willingness to live for God. Um, you know, we sing the song, um, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. You know, that is the mindset of saying the heart is willing. When the heart is willing and the flesh is weak, then prayer is what we need. Let me say that again. When the heart is willing, the heart is willing here, you know, is speaking about a person whose mindset is of such that they are willing to serve God. They are willing to be righteous. They want to be holy. They want to live a clean life. Paul, Paul picks it up in Romans 7. I believe this is like a parallel scripture in some sort. If we look at Romans 7 verse 22, the Bible says, Paul says, For in, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. What is he saying? My heart is willing. In my inner being, I delight after the, you know, the inner man. So Paul is saying that, look here. I am, I am, my heart is willing. I want to serve God. In Romans, in, in, verse, in verse 23, he says, But I see another law at work in my body. Warring against the law of my mind and holding me into captivity of the law of sin and death within me. What is he saying? The flesh is weak. He wants to live for God, but each time, you know, when he tries, the flesh will pull him down. And Jesus is saying that. When you, I, I, I remember several years ago, we had an evangelist, a prophet came to church, and he said a lot of things. He did a lot of miracles. But the thing that stood with me the most was a statement he made. He said, find yourself in the Bible. And I'm like, find yourself in the Bible? What do you mean by that? Find yourself. There is a scripture in the Bible that describes you exactly how you are and you can find that scripture and when you find that scripture know that that is who you are and the bible will tell you how to move to what you are to be so find yourself in the scripture so when somebody's when when when, when, when we're at a place when the heart is willing we don't really need a lot of preaching at that time you know we don't really need a lot of preaching and i tell you why because our mind is made up already. We already decide that we're going to live for God. Yes, preaching is always necessary. Yes, you know, we will always hear the word of God. I'm not saying, that's not what I'm saying, that the word of God is not necessary. But what I'm saying is that for that individual, he may already make up in his mind that he, he want to walk with God. The problem he's having is that he's weak in the flesh. Have you ever, have you ever in church yet and you just make up and you say, yeah, man, I'm just do this right. I'm just do it the right way. I'm just live for God. The, 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 the moderator come on and sing the song, I want to be a Christian in my heart. And I say, yes, God. The, next, the, the, the song, the, the, the person that sing came on and said, you know, my soul says yes. Says yes, says yes. And I said, yes, Lord, my soul says yes. And then now, as you go outside, by the time you reach, by the time you reach home, you find yourself doing something that is wrong. And some people will look and I say, "Why hypocrite? Look how I'm in church." I say, "Yeah, he make up his mind." And probably they're right, but sometimes it's not that the person is a hypocrite. Sometimes it's that the person's heart is willing. They are. They want to serve God, but the flesh is weak. They don't have any resistance. And Jesus said to his disciples, the way you overcome this is by prayer. He said, pray because the heart is willing and the flesh is weak. So you are to pray because the heart is willing and the, fl the flesh is weak. And so um, Jesus, again, Jesus is omniscient. He could have told them anything. 
But he diagnosed their problem and said, look here, what you need right now is to spend some more time in prayer. Um, let us move on. Now the next thing, and the last thing we're going to look at, the last thing we're going to look at is, um, is worship. The last thing we're going to look at quickly is worship. I'm not sure if I'm being told that it's just probably five minutes leave. So, um, should we even start this? Maybe we should leave this. All right, let us just look at the scripture and then we'll continue next week on this topic. So, Jesus teaching on worship. Let us look at John 4, verse 20 to 24. So, John 4, verse 20 to 24. Um, in fact, let us start at verse 19. Verse 19 said, The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and he say that in Jerusalem is the place where men are to worship. Jesus says unto her, Woman, believe, believe me, the hour cometh when he shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Next scripture. Continue. He worship, he know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so this is one of the most profound discourse on worship that I have come across anywhere, in the Bible or anywhere. So the first thing I want us to notice is that worship was tied to a place. The woman says, our father worship in this mountain. You know, speaking about a physical place. But he, and he here is talking about the Jews. The Jews say that Jerusalem, another place. Jerusalem is the place that men are to worship. So, when we look in the Bibles, we, we see that there are several Old Testament references that tied worship to a physical place. Um, in the interest of time, we're not going to go to some of these. But when we look at Genesis 22, verse 4 to 5, we see where, you know, um, Abraham said that I and the lad is going to go yonder to worship. And he he, if you read the scripture, you will see that in verse 4 he says, when he saw the place, or when they see the place, or when they were able to see the place. So there was a, there was a physical place that he left, and he literally went there to worship. Um, when we look at Exodus 3 and verse 12, we, um, we, we see where you know, um, Moses was asked to actually Bring back the children of, he says, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, um, you will worship God on this mountain. And so the implication there is that they really could worship in Egypt as they ought. And, you know, yes, there's a lot of types and shadows there because Egypt kind of represents sin. And it's very difficult. And we really shouldn't be worshiping God in sin. But as I said, we're not... We're we, we kind of going through quickly. But God wanted him to bring, God wanted Moses to bring back the, bring back the people here, um, a place where 
a place where he has he has already declared to be a place that he had to take off his shoes from off his feet because it was holy so you know as i said there's a lot there in this scripture he wanted him to bring he wanted moses to bring back the people to a place where you know it was declared that the place was holy and that the presence of the lord is there i mean in essence that is what we're doing in the spiritual realm where we are trying to bring people from Egypt, a place of sin, to, a, um, um, to a, physical, a, a, a spiritual place of holiness. You know? but, but I want you to understand that here is a place, a physical place again, a mountain. Um, again, when you look in the scriptures, you see where there are several references of mountain um, that is used in... in um, in reference to worship or in reference to knowing God. Um, Herob was a mountain. Herob, Herob, sorry, I think I'm pronouncing that wrong. It was a mountain or is a mountain where Moses actually met with God. And there again, he had to take off his shoes from off his feet because he, he stood on holy ground. Um, we know about what happened at Mount Carmel where, you know, um, um, Josh, um, Elijah actually called fire down from heaven and there was a great um, the, you know, presence of God, God, a great victory of God. And there are other mountains that we come across where it is said that the, the, the Lord presents there. In fact, in the Bible, there is even a scripture that person said that God was a God of the mountain. And so there is this long history of worship being tied to a place, worship being tied to a mountaintop experience, you know? Um, and it was here where the woman is saying, the woman is saying that, um, the woman is saying that basically they worship God in this mountain. Um, she probably pointed to a mountain physically and said, and pointed to it and showed Jesus that you know, we, we worship God in this mountain. Um, but the Jews are saying that is it in Jerusalem is the place that man ought to worship. Now, what that did for the Samaritan is that it is saying that, well, making null and void the, the, the worship of the Samaritan because it was not in the correct place, as it were. So the Jews are saying that, you are not worshipping God the right way because you are not worshipping him in Jerusalem. Now, the thing about it is that the Samaritans weren't probably even allowed to go to the place of worship in Jerusalem. And so, it's like, in essence, they were kind of manipul having a monopoly on worship. You know, they couldn't, nobody else could worship God because they are saying that you had to worship him in Jerusalem. Jesus, however, shifted the focus from the place to the object of worship. It wasn't so much the place, but it was the fact that they knew not what they worshipped. So Jesus said, well, look here, your worship, in essence, the implication is that your worship is not so hot. Not because of the place, but because you don't know what you worship. Because salvation is of the Jews, Right? Salvation is of the Jews, and so you don't really know God. You don't have an experience with him. You know, God will sometimes reveal himself to us through situations. You know, and so the scripture says that um, they know me as God Almighty, but by my name, Jehovah Jireh, had they not known me. He was now getting ready to reveal himself as Jehovah Jireh through the experiences that they were, they were going to go through. Now, the Samaritan would not have gone through any of those experiences, you know, because salvation was of the Jews. So they, wouldn't have not have, they would not have gone through any of those experiences that would to reveal to them in any real way who God is. Huh? And so worship and the depth of our worship is tied to our knowledge of God. It is our knowledge of God 
that determine. It's not how loud you shout. It's not how much you run the aisles. But it is your knowledge of God that determines the depth of your worship. Okay, so that's what Jesus was saying. You don't know what you worship, so your worship is not so, you know? That, that is the true problem. It's not so much the location, but it's the fact that you don't know what you worship. So, um, so notice he said, the overcometh and is now is when the true worshiper shall come. So, Notice he's using future, futuristic languages here, language here. So he didn't point to the, the patriarchs of old. He didn't point, point to David and said, you know, if you want to see true worship, you know, look at the life of David. No, he didn't point to David. Neither did he point, point to Abraham and said, you know, look at Abraham for true worship. But he was pointing to a time in the future. He said, the overcometh. It is coming. And now is when the true worshiper shall come. Right? So we said, although David and other patriarchs were strongly influenced by the spirit that enhanced their worship. So David, um, David was a tremendous worshiper of God and he danced out of his clothes as it was. And he was a man after God's own heart. So we know he was a man after God's own heart. And we know that he danced before God in worship. You know? Con and while it is true that some of us will never reach David level in worship, so even, even some of us as children of God, we will probably not attain to David, David's level of worship. Every recipient of the Holy Ghost has the capacity to know God and to worship God in ways that the patriarch could not. You understand what I'm saying here? When we receive the Holy Ghost, we have the capacity to be extraordinary in worship. To go far beyond where David went. Because why? Because when we get the Holy Ghost, we, we also uh, receive the capacity to know God in ways that they, they did not know God. Right? And I'll prove it. It's, if God is in you, if the Holy Ghost is in you, as opposed to somebody without the Holy Ghost. You know, that is the difference that we are speaking about here. So our capacity to know God, our ceiling to know God is much higher than theirs were. But are we using it? Are we actually making full cap um, use of this potential that we have? We have the potential to be you know, extraordinary in worship, but it's not all of us will utilize and actually become a true worshiper. All right? And I say, I'm trying to go fast in the interest of time because I don't want to come back here next week. So in Matthew 11, verse 11, um, let us look at that scripture. Matthew 11, verse 11 it speaks about, um, it gives a comparison between John the Baptist and the church, our, the kingdom, our people in the kingdom of God. And this is a profound statement. This is a, a drop mouth statement. Um, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, among them, among that are born of a woman, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. This is our big statement, you know, because when we look, well, what Jesus is saying here, Jesus is saying that up until this time, we have never, John is really the greatest person up until the time of John, before Jesus was born. Up until the time of John, there is not risen a greater than John. Now, when we look at some of the folks that preceded John, when we look at Elijah that called fire down from heaven, when we look at Solomon in all his glory, all his splendor, all his fancy clothes, all his kingly array, and when we compare him to John who was dressed funny, he had um, 
um, lions here and all of those things. He was dressed, I, I can't remember the exact quotation for how he was dressed. You know, but nothing compared to what, how, um, how, how Solomon would have dressed. In fact, in fact, Jesus implied that one of the reasons they did not believe John is because of how he dressed. Because he didn't dress the part. He didn't dress like Christians, quote unquote. And Jesus asked the question, what went he out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? He said, those who were suffering are in king's palaces. So in doing that, Jesus put the dress issue to location. He's saying that, he's saying that, John dressed the way he dressed because of where he was. He was in the wilderness and that's why he dressed like that. When you went out, when you go out in the wilderness, did you expect to see somebody that dressed like they were in a king's palace? So he puts it to the climatic conditions, which really what, you know, um, really what dressing is about. Jesus has never really um, tried to distinguish himself as being holy by the way he dressed. You know, the Pharisees is the one that kind of did that. Jesus encouraged us to show love to our brethren. This is how they are, people are to know that we are Christians. Anyway, I, I kind of digress there. Um, so, so here the Bible says, verily, um, so, here the, so here the scripture says that, um, you know, up until this point, there has never been a greater person than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding though, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So Jesus is saying that the least of us, who is the least among us, brother? Who is the least among us? Well, Paul said that he's the least. Why Paul said he was the least? I don't believe Paul though. But Paul said he's the least. Why he said that he's the least? Because he persecuted the church. He said that, you know, he was the least among the, the, the saints because he persecuted the church before he got saved. And so, you know, we shouldn't really persecute Christians because, you know, that's a bad thing. That makes us the least in the kingdom. And we have some Christians that are persecuting Christians, which is a bad thing, you know. But whoever the least is, the Bible is saying that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Why? Why the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John? Again, it comes back to the Holy Spirit that God has invested in us. Right? So make us look at the let us look at the next slide. So Jesus went on to say, God is a spirit. So God is not uh, I actually said uh, but the 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 actual translations, I know some translation put the word I uh, in there, but the original text wouldn't have a. Uh. So it would have said God is spirit. Um, and so because God is spirit, they that worship him must worship him in spirit. And again, he is using here the common spirit. He's not using the fully uppercase spirit, which generally means that he's speaking about the Holy Spirit, you know. But it is, speak, it is using the common S spirit, which speaks to your spirit. So God is saying that you have to worship him in your own spirit and in truth. Um, we are not speaking about the days of his flesh now. So we're not speaking about when, when we say God is spirit, we are talking about, you know, the eternal spirit that fills the universe. We're not speaking about when he came in the form of flesh. Um, so, so Jesus is saying, where worship is concerned, it is what is happening in the spirit that matters. Right? Let me say that again. Where worship is concerned, 
It is what is happening in the spirit that matters. In worship, our physical expression must coincide with our physical state for us to have true worship. Okay? Um, our hallelujah shout must occur in our spirit before expressed through our mouth or, or, or through our body. So, um, so what I'm saying here, when we are worshiping God, God is not so much looking at what our bodies are doing. You know, we may be running the church, but God is not looking at that. God is not impressed by that. We might be shouting loud, but God is not impressed by our shout. God is always zoomed in on what is occurring in our spirit. And he's always seeing what is happening there. And that is what he sees. And, you know, if, wor if true worshiping is happening there, then you're doing true worshiping. But if true worshiping is not happening there in, in your spirit, because it's possible that your spirit is doing one thing and your body is doing something else. But God will always be looking at what is happening in the spirit. Okay, so I think this is the final slide. The next slide probably is the final slide. Okay, this slide is the final slide. So let us look at this scripture now here in... Um, let us look at this scripture in... Matthew 15, verse 7 to 9. So, so here Jesus is speaking to, here Jesus is speaking to the, the Pharisees and he says, hypocrites, um, well did Isaiah or Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, verse 8, This people draw nigh me, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. And so, um, I think this is a good note for us to end. Um, Jesus is encouraging us to not just to give lip service. Right? Not just to give lip service. Not just to um, be, not just to give physical, you know, physical worship as it was. Not just to be running the aisle. Yes, that is good because um, there's a funny thing about the spirit. Sometimes what is happening in the spirit will reflect in our physical expression. You know, although it is possible, as I said before, that what is happening physically is not really happening in our, in our spirit. When we are in true worship, you know, if we are shouting in our hearts, then, you know, Sometimes it will come out of our mouth, and that is true worship. You know, we can feel ecstatic in our spirit, and it causes us to want to run the aisles, and we run the aisles in true worship towards God. You know, but what I'm saying is that it's what is happening in, in the spirit, because it is possible for us to run the aisles, and in our in our spirit we are just thinking of who is looking at us, and that is not true worship. That's that is what. The Bible here refers to as worshiping him in vain. Okay. So I hope you would have um, received something from what was said here today. Um, especially as it relates to prayer. And especially as it relates to ensuring that, you know, we set up a system of prayer. Where we spend enough time to seek God. Um, the secret, I believe the secret. For, to, for being a Christian, a true Christian, is to spend a lot of time in prayer unto God. All right, so we're going to close on that note. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for your words. They are a lamp unto our path. Dear God, we thank you, O oh God, 
for your word. We thank you for what was discussed here today. Dear God, we pray that you will breathe upon it. Speak to the heart, dear God. What I have failed to explain properly, fill in the blanks, God, so that your people will, be, will benefit from your words. Have your own way as we give you all the glory. You alone is worthy of all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are dismissed.